Well, it's really lovely to see so many new and also so many familiar faces here today. Thank you, first of all, for the effort and the expense that you've put just to come and meet here. We really appreciate it. Um, this conference, the aim of this conference is to shine a light on the use of systems approaches in, uh, to build inclusive markets and reduce poverty. Um, I'm Mike Albu. I'm the director of, I'm the program director for the Beam Exchange. Um, I'm hugely excited about the program that my team and all of the speakers from about more than 30 organizations have brought together for the next two days. I'm going to be your host, along with my colleague, Bushra Ahmed. Good morning, everybody. I'm Bushra Ahmed. Firstly, I'd just like to say I'm so delighted to see all of you here. For all these weeks, I've been emailing you and you've been cooperating with me, so thank you very much for that. We're very excited to have you and a warm welcome. Before we move on, I just, uh, before we move on to the formal proceedings with our wonderful panel here, just wanted to mention, at registration yesterday, you would have received your welcome packs. Inside your welcome packs, you'll have your agenda booklet. That booklet will tell you about the programs over the next two days, including all of our speakers' details. So please refer to that. Mike? Great, thank you. Well, we've got five very distinguished speakers to open the whole proceedings here today. I'm gonna, I won't introduce them all at once. I'm going to introduce them in pairs, starting with Patricia Seeks and Ruben Banda. Now, Patricia Seeks is Head of Profession for Private Sector Development at the Department for International Development. And Ruben Banda is the Managing Director of Musica, which is a Zambian not-for-profit company that uses market systems approaches to, uh, to develop uh, opportunities for agricultural markets in Zambia. Patricia, do you want to take over? Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Let me start by adding my welcome to you all. It's fantastic to see so many people here. I'm really looking forward to hearing about the experiences of such a vibrant and diverse group of practitioners. It's also fantastic for me to be back in Zambia. It was actually in Zambia that I first came across the term making markets work for the poor. I was working on the Africa Agriculture Markets program with the World Bank and Comesa. And the program was funded by DFID. And DFID had stipulated that it should be an M4P program. And at that time, 2008, I was working for the World Bank and I'd never heard of M4P. So I had to look it up. Uh, and what I found really resonated with me, the talk of market failure, tackling causes, not symptoms, incentives, behaviors, intervening in markets to make them deeper, more accessible, more effective, more productive, more profitable, not for the sake of it, but for poor people. So I was sold, and I think it was DFID's association with the approach that attracted me to DFID in 2011. I joined as a PSD advisor, and I was posted to Nigeria which was a little bit different to Zambia. And uh, in Nigeria, I was responsible for two M4P programs, one of which is presenting this afternoon, so I'm very proud. So it's no surprise then that now head of profession for PSD in DFID, that I'm an advocate for market systems, approaches and programs. But I'm not a blind advocate. I'm conscious that we face criticisms and challenges in selling this approach to others, which as advocates and practitioners, I think we need to be alive to and to debate frankly and openly at events such as this. I'll share my thoughts on some of these criticisms and challenges with you in a moment. But first, let me say a few words about why DFID cares about market systems approaches and why we support the Beam Exchange. DFID is committed to supporting developing countries to self-finance their own exit from poverty and using the power of the private sector to drive development and achieve poverty reduction. And we recognise the importance of market systems in this and in the lives and livelihoods of poor people. That's why we support programmes such as Musika here in Zambia. In fact, when we last counted, DFID had more than 40 programs using market systems approaches, totaling nearly a billion dollars. So a big investment which underpins our decision, along with our colleagues at the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, to fund the BEAM exchange to continue building the market systems knowledge base. 
in particular to fill some gaps in theory and guidance, to support knowledge management and lesson sharing, and to improve monitoring and evaluation in a tricky field. We also wanted to support the application of market systems approaches to new sectors and test it in new contexts. And it's clear from the participation in this event that the field has grown in the last few years. Nevertheless, we do face some criticisms and challenges in selling it to others. I want to mention three. Firstly, what do we actually mean by systemic or systems approaches? We seem to struggle to explain it in simple terms without resorting to the jargon that we as practitioners use amongst ourselves. I think BEAM has taken us forward, but there's still more to do to demystify for others the what, why and the how. And being clearer might help get a common understanding amongst ourselves. I come across programmes and I hear great things from the stakeholders and beneficiaries about their impact. But I find myself wondering, is that really market systems as I understand it? Which leads to the second challenge I often hear from others. Market systems approaches are great in theory, but are they actually practicable and implementable in the real world of five-year programmes, log frames, annual reviews, and pressure for results? We need to recognise the reality, the political economy, if you like, of our operating context. So how can we manage the pressure for short-term results? How can we get buy-in for enough problem analysis before starting pilots? How can we monitor the prospects for systemic change? I think that better evidence would help with this. But the third challenge is, where is the evidence that this works beyond case studies and log frames? Where is the independent impact evaluation evidence? Have we got evidence for systemic change and not just of the immediate beneficiaries in log frames? Where is the hard evidence of value for money, not just in theory, but in practice? Those of us who believe in market systems approaches believe it's better than what went before, but I don't think that's really enough. After nearly 15 years and developments in impact evaluation methodologies, I think we could have better evidence to substantiate our claims. I believe passionately in market systems approaches, but I do worry about our response to some of these challenges. So I hope you'll keep them in your mind over the next two days. I'm really looking forward to the conference and to hearing your views. So once again, let me thank you all for coming. And now let me hand over to Ruben. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia, for that, uh, for that insight and the discussion. I wish to take this opportunity to thank the BIM Exchange, in particular Mike, for inviting me to speak at this conference. And thank you, Patricia, for those uh, thought-provoking uh, insights or uh, ideas. And I'm sure this will uh, stimulate a lot of discussion in the next uh, two days and more especially to help uh, uh, contextualize the market systems approach. A warm welcome to you and the rest of the participants, and it's good to see you all here, and that you have taken your time to be here. And I can see also some familiar faces, so such conferences help to bring uh, people together uh, beyond the market systems uh, uh, approach. And I wish uh, a warm welcome to you, and I uh, hope that you are going to enjoy the Zambian hospitality, and if you have got some time after uh, this conference, please take time or find time to visit some of the tourist attractions uh, here in Zambia. Like Patricia have said, I also had my share and experience in working with the market systems uh, programs for the past uh, four and a half years. And I have seen uh, quite a lot that has happened. And especially at the, at the hymn of one of the uh, uh, market facilitating organization called Musika. For those of you who may not know, Musika basically means a market in here in Zambia. And the Musika is funded by DFID and the, uh, the Swedish Embassy uh, to help and endeavor to fully utilize the marketing market works for the, uh, for the poor. But the question still remains how much 
or how many uh, poor people can we reach out out there, especially if you talk about the bottom, uh, the poor at the bottomless of the pit of the pyramid. Uh, we have implemented a number of numerous uh, uh, interventions, uh, by supported, uh, and by this time we are supporting about uh, 64 uh, corporate clients, currently providing improved market access to approximately 320,000 small-scale farmers across Zambia. In the process, we have also helped to facilitate the establishment of over 2,000 intermediaries or, or new point of access to agriculture inputs, services, and output market in rural uh, areas that are mostly isolated. But despite this success that we have achieved, like Patricia has, has indicated, it is quite a challenge to, uh, to work within uh, the context of the environment that we are in. So having said this, it is really quite difficult and challenging to work with the uh, market system. Just a quick uh, reflection of what Patricia has said in her uh, opening uh, speech uh, on the market systems. Much as the market systems approach in terms of the theoretical frameworks and the principles provide the platform for a multiple players to participate in the market to, include, to achieve inclusive growth, it is quite, in reality, the ground is very much different than we see it in theory or on paper. And actually, for better of a, lack of a, a better term to use, it's quite a mess out there on the ground because you need, need to uh, do with certain things that we, which you are not uh, foreseen as you are doing your planning and your designing. Just to reflect on a few of them, and in, in response to what Patricia has said, the fact that the market systems approach uh, entail that you work with multiple players in the market, the question is how do you develop the incentives or align those incentives to make sure that these market players participate in the market when you know that we have different objectives to achieve at the end of the day. Then the other thing that we need also to take into consideration as we are doing is the time that it takes for some of these things to come to fruition. The market you are using market system approach is a recommended uh, approach which we fully believe and, 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 and support. The time of most of these donor funded projects that we have is quite too short to, receive, uh, to achieve a meaningful uh, uh, systematic change, especially when you are dealing with market that uh, have got uh, a lot of uh, bottlenecks and, 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 and uh, bottlenecks at the end of the day. Then the ideal world that we always talk about in the theories of the market systems, and you understand uh, what I'm talking about, being the gurus of the market system approach, does not exist on the ground. But it is our role as market players or market facilitators to create and facilitate the creation of that uh, real world that we talk about and that may take a lot of time, challenges, and including your own resources. Another thing that also we need to understand is, uh, in terms of how do we uh, match the, di the, di the different uh, cultural systems, norms, and infrastructure that exist, to find in certain cases, the infrastructures or information is not there. And also understanding the drivers of change, that also becomes a critical mass. As I conclude, allow me also to thank you the organizers of this uh, particular conference, uh, in particular, choosing Zambia as a host, a host nation, to, and to all of you, the participants, I wish you that you have going to have a fruitful deliberation over the next two days, and I'm confident that by the end of the conference, you will attest that it has been well, worthwhile spending your time here, and the, your time has not gone into vain. Ziko Mokambiri, and may God bless you. Thank, thank you very much, Ruben, um, and thank you, Patricia. I will uh, be coming back to some of those thoughtful <coughs> challenges, those thoughtful questions in my, later in my, uh, my presentation about the objectives for the conference. I also want to say a quick thanks, Ruben, for very kindly hosting a field visit on Saturday morning which I know some of you have signed up for, which I'm sure will be very interesting and give you a chance to see a bit more of this beautiful country. Bushra. Okay, fab. So I was going to say, for the field visit on Saturday, there are a few spaces left. So if you would like to attend, just send me an email. Um, apart from that, 
Just apologies on the technical difficulties, but we're just setting up this morning, so just bear with us for that, please. Now, I would like to introduce our next exciting session. So we've got Dolika Banda and Betty Wilkinson. Dolika has been working with, she's on the board of FSD Zambia and FSD Africa. She's had 15 years experience with the IFC. She's a very well experienced financial sector expert. And she is also the group chair of Focus Financial Services Zambia. We've got Betty as well. Betty is newly taking over from Joanna Ledgerwood as the CEO of, of the financial sector deepening Zambia. She's been appointed last month, and before that, she, was, she spent 12 years with the Asian Development Bank as Director for Financial Sector and Trade, Central and West Asia. She's a long career spanning work as a banker, a senior government official, and a variety of other roles in Asia and Africa. Over to you both. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good morning. I'm, I will take a segue from Mr. Banda, and I'm very amused that we have two bandas on the panel. <laughs> Thank you to the organizers. But I wanted to take a segue from your last um, sentence, Mr. Banda, which was Ziko Mokwambiri. And I see a lot of people in this room who may not have understood what that was. For those of you who didn't, he was basically saying thank you very much. So I'd like to echo and say thank you for choosing Zambia to the organizers, and thank you for showing up in great numbers. I've also heard the challenges that have been raised um, both by Patricia and by Ruben. Betty and I are just going to have a conversation around what I have experienced in, as FSDZ, but also what she is bringing from her experience and her work globally into FSD Zambia. So the main context of this conversation is why do market systems matter to financial inclusion and how we can help to deepen financial markets through information, innovation, and impact. So all the challenges that you raised, Mr. Banda, we're going to try and see. We can never have a solution that is going to be immediate. You spoke about the timelines, but at least we can try and share with you what FSD Zambia and FSD Africa has been doing and is doing in order to, to uh, help with these challenges. So welcome and thanks again. I'll just put a little bit of context around it because some of you may not know Zambia very well in order for you to understand the challenges that we're facing and therefore the impact of some of the solutions that we're putting on the table. So Zambia is a landlocked country with about 16 million people as of 2014. 66% of that population is under 24 and largely disenfranchised. As an economy, we're dependent on copper. There's a number of other minerals and gemstones, but it's largely copper. For the last few years, Zambia has been touted as one of the fastest growing economies in Africa. But in the last two to three years, we have seen that story really dwindle. Our economy has been doubly damaged by commodity slowdown, which, which is really part of the global uh, economic slowdown, but also droughts. Droughts have impacted our agribusiness, which is very much a dependency for the rural area, and also it has impacted our hydropower um, capacity. Therefore, we have an energy crisis, all of which dovetails into a whole bunch of things for the economy. Secondly, the reality is that our nation is poor. Over 56, when you look at the Oxford uh, University Multidimensional Poverty Index that was done in 2015, Zambia rates at 56.6%. But out of that, one has to keep in mind that 74% is the figure for the rural area, and that's the bulk of our population. So with that context in mind, I just wanted to ask you, Betty, if you can talk about the financial lives of the poor and what we know from the FinScop survey, which I know was released last year, and also the National Geospatial Mapping Exercise mm -hmm. and our Financial <coughs> Diaries work, which was launched yesterday and was very um, interesting. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Is it working? Okay, thanks, thanks. Um, I'd like to, to acknowledge Joanna Ledgerwood, my predecessor who's in the room today, and was the really pushed to have all of this lack of information filled, these gaps all filled. So now we have this very rich set of information, um, everything from high level statistics from the FinScope survey and the geospatial mapping to individual interviews with over 350 families over a year to tell us, to inform us on the circumstances of financial services for the poor. So 
We saw increases of informal financial services and also in blends of formal and, infor and informal services from the population here. There was an increase between 2009 and 2015 uh, over the FinScope of 22% increase in financial inclusion in the country. This is a big step here. But we found that the, the concentration of, of access in higher income brackets and in, in, in urban areas was not so in the, uh, encouraging as the challenges that women, casual workers, and rural households are still facing in access to financial services. Um, informal finance is very high in this country. Only Uganda is higher in the percentage of people who access informal services. Even in our office, we have chilimbas and we have savings groups. Um, and the biggest growth in the formal sector we're seeing is mobile money, mobile fi financial users. Uh, the most fundamental challenges place, faced by the poor, according to the information we have, are cash flow management, risk management, asset building, and productive investment. Should be no surprises there. It's almost throughout the entire economy that people face these things. When we asked through FinScope, when people told us, what people told us was the main barriers for them to financial services, they don't think that they have enough money to justify using them, and they don't think that they will be able to keep minimum balances in their accounts. So this was their barriers that they perceived. Respondents for the year-long detailed financial diaries process told us yesterday when we talked to them that they found the paperwork for open accounts was absolutely impenetrable. It would take them a week or two weeks to open an account. And that the, they didn't have collateral for loans and they found it easier and more accessible to save at home, borrow from a money lender, or borrow and save with their friends and relatives. It was closer. And that for mobile money and insurance, a vast majority of those surveys still don't even know what these are, let alone how to use them. The geospatial mapping that we did shows substantial areas of the country where there are simply no financial services available. This is particularly true in low density areas of the country, which form actually the majority of this country. There are less than 10 people per square kilometer in a majority of the country right now. The poorest areas and those which have a majority of farmers and fishermen are the least well serves. But our mapping showed that there are schools, there are health facilities, there are agricultural facilities which could provide these kinds of services as a second generation. And so the mobile money services providers got very excited about this mapping and they're already talking about how they provide services. We are also seeing that in the geospatial mapping, we saw that the first entry into a poor area in terms of formal services is agents, either a bank agent or a mobile money agent. So the financial diaries are still coming out with the data. The process was just finished in January, but they're helping fill out some gaps for us. Low income households have extremely rich financial lives here as they do in many countries. They have a wide variety of income sources, seven to 10 income sources. They're meeting larger and unexpected expenses by saving with assets, saving with friends, and just put burying money underneath the kitchen. In our survey, 70% of households had an illness during the course of the year, which caused them to lose money. So this is a big one for them. And they aren't spending the money on health services either. Um, salaried, workers, very interestingly, less likely to save than anyone else, more likely to borrow than anyone else, and counting on that next month's salary to, to cover the gap. And the rest of the population who don't earn a regular wage have a great deal of uncertainty that they handle by owning easily sold assets and maintaining financial exchanges with others. So they are also picking up on using mobile money back and forth. So that's pretty much where we are in this. Dolika? Thanks. Thank you very much, Betty. So it seems from all of the studies that um, both the issues that were raised by Patricia in terms of how are we sure that this is really working and what can we be doing to make sure that the market systems approach works as well as some of the challenges that, that Ruben raised have come out very clearly in the surveys. So 
it is clear that most of the people in these markets, and I speak for people that are very close to my family, I'm first generation, well-to-do and educated, if you, can, if you can put it that way. What they really need is better services, access to information, and they need this in a sustainable way. And I really would like to ask from the reports and the surveys that we have done, what is the next step for FSDZ in terms of helping the markets and low-income households to provide information on financial services that are available to them on a day-to-day -day basis, but also the newer platforms such as mobile banking and micro-insurance. I really would like you to delve a little bit into what the plans are mm -hmm. for FSDZ to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now we have a lot of data. We're busy turning it into information and from information comes action uh, for, for a variety of players. We have two main jobs for FSDZ. The first thing is we have to share this information and encourage suppliers of financial services and mar market regulators to use it, be responsive to what the end clients are all telling us because the messages are very clear. We can use this information to influence change in the market, to support innovation to, and increased outreach that can make sure that everyone gets better potential and actual access, particularly poor households. The second thing is we have to develop ways to improve poor people's understanding of their choices, what products and services are out there, what they can use, how they can influence the services changing to better suit them. And there's an interactive process between these because incentives of the various actors in the markets are not always clear. They change depending on the environment, the circumstances, the timeline, and also what's going on in the macro economy. So it's important that we listen and understand the incentives of all the players in the market and why they act the way they do, where there are opportunities to influence that, that um, circumstance or intervene so that we can affect change. And that enables us to move par in parallel. So we collect information, we share information, we interact with all the players, and we encourage them to interact with each other to say, what's this all about? What do we want? What do we need? What can we sell? What can we buy? Um, and what works? This often means advising regulators or financial service providers to think way outside the box and to take more risks. There's a lot of trial and error here. There's a lot of back and forth. Sometimes you'll move for a while, and then it stops, then it'll move again for a while, or something else will move much faster. And things take time. They're not always predictable. Dalika, let me turn to you as a board member now of two FSDs, FSD Zambia and FSD Africa, and ask you how you've seen our work result in innovation in the financial market and better services for poor families. Thanks. Is that better? Thank you. It's a real privilege, I should say, to be on both uh, FSD Africa and FSD Zambia and see the work that's being done and uh, co coordinate how this work is being done within the region. In Zambia, I think there's three um, concrete examples that we can give. And it's interesting that yesterday, the results of the diaries talked a lot about people's participation in the survey but a lot about the multiplier effect of those people who participated. So the diaries was 350 families, but through the extended family, extended community, and socialization, which are the cultural norms that we were talking about earlier, the information and the encouragement and the work that is being done actually reached 7,000 people. So we often talk about statistics as donors, and Patricia, I'm looking at you, um, to say, how can we prove that market systems are working and really reaching out to the poor? 350 for 7,000, I think is a good statistic. So please go back and tell Diffid we need to continue doing what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so for FSD Zambia in particular, I've been taken with the three initiatives that, 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 uh, that Joanna, you've shared with us since I started on the board earlier this year. The first is the work that we're doing with the savings groups. So again, going back to the community multiplier effect. Within the savings groups, 
they actually are formal. They have constitutions and they manage their own savings and they even do interlending processes. For those from Kenya and parts of East Africa, I think they are SACOs is the equivalent. So these are formal financial institutions, but just not regulated by a central bank. And what FSD Zambia has been doing is to work with them to help them to extend their larger services so that they can reach a larger part of the community. But also we work with them almost on an advisory basis to help them to understand the alternative ways of using money as well as the alternative services, that are financial services that are available to them. So I think this is great and I understand, I haven't yet uh, visited a chief, but I understand that we've now got some chiefs who are very strong um, heads of communities in our societies actually wanting FSDZ to expand this work with them. So that, that, that one I think is a great group, with, it's a great story with a savings group. One of the second examples I'd like to give is that the work we're doing with Technical Assistance Group in conjunction with a few financial institutions. Technical Assistance Group is a, a group founded by Zambians who wanted to really expand microinsurance. And they have significantly expanded the uptake as we speak, um, both rural and individual, um, working with small life uh, insurance policies and also most recently, which is very relevant for Zambia, they've introduced a weather index for crop insurance, which as an agrarian community and the rural being largely agrarian, this is a fantastic product that I hope we can expand and explore. Thirdly, we are working with financial services providers, both non-bank as well as bank financial institutions to try and help them to recognize that businesses are hungry for the same services as the poor are. So small businesses can have just as much of a need in terms of advisory services, in terms of financial services, in terms of capital, in terms of working um, operating capital as well as long-term capital. And we are working with banks, we are working with the NBFIs, also working with the regulator very strongly and Bank of Zambia, I don't know if they're here, but I do believe that until now they've been very, very cooperative in helping us to change these markets. And the main aim for us is to make sure that the incentives are matched for the relationship between the financial services providers and the clients of those financial services providers who are, can be the poor, it can be the low income households, but it can also be the, and the S and M end of the small and medium enterprises who are really going to be the engines and the drivers of these economies. So I also urge people as we speak not to think just about low income households, but to also think about who can be even more catalytic in, in, catalytic in terms of driving the economy. And sometimes we may have to work with those small entrepreneurs. Um, so let me then turn to you, Betty, just for conclusion. Um, what kind of evidence do you think we need to be able to show that the market system's approach to financial inclusion works mm -hmm. for the poor? Mm -hmm. I should have asked Patricia, but. Uh. <laughs> In the end, if we find more people are using a wider variety of services and can speak intelligibly about this, that's the final end point. And in between, we do a lot of work on results chains. We do a lot of work, we, we have a whole team that looks at monitoring and evaluation on this. And we look at the steps in between. We start at sustainability, work backwards, and say, where are we now? So data becomes important to us that because it helps us understand what's happening in the market. The work we're doing on supply is important and we look at the work on supply and what happens and what products are changing and how they're looking at relationships rather than just products. And the services need to be easier and more understandable. Right now, it's my insurance um, requirements or my insurance um, policy for my car is way more expensive and way more crazy in terms of understanding than any of the microinsurance policies that are issued in the country. And I love that. People can actually understand what's written there. There's no exclusions, blah, blah, blah. So, and then the way that we communicate those services is equally important. With so many people here in Zambia, and I'm sure that this is true throughout the world, I found it in Asia as well when I was working there. If so many people around the world don't even understand what is this product, then don't we owe it to them to sit and talk to them about what the product is and see how we might, do they want to use it? If not, we're in the wrong room. If they do want to use it, we need to be sure that they can use it and find it easy to use. 
So in the end, that's what we look for. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. So those are some very insightful points from both of you and from FSD Zambia's work, so thank you very much. What, uh, Mike would like to start the next session, that'd be good? Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Dolika and Betty. That I, I mean, personally, I found it very helpful to kind of hear a, gra a kind of practical, grounded example of what market systems development means um, that's not lost in abstract concepts. It's, it, it, was very, it really uh, helps set the tone for what we're going to be doing during the conference, which is talking about real life experiences of, of poor people and why market systems work matters for people living in poverty. But before we do that, um, I've got one final speaker from the panel who I want to introduce. He's a very familiar name, Jim Tamburn. He's the coordinator of the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development. And he's ideally placed well, I've asked him to do two things, really. I've, I've asked him to explain, if, uh, take stock of how we got here, you know, what's the, what's the history of the evolution of this kind of w way of working. But also, I think he's going to try and put that in, in a broader context and, under, and, and, and explain how market systems development relates to other, de other trends, if you like, in the, in the development field. Jim. Will you all get a sound bomb? No? Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, so I really appreciate Mike phrasing the, the two things I was going to try and do because someone said to me last night, whatever you do, don't talk about the past. Um, but, but I was thinking about it. I think it, actually it is quite important in market systems approaches because we've had quite a colorful past. And I was particularly struck in... Um, Bangkok, where the donor committee had a conference in Bangkok in March on uh, results measurement. And we had a session on measuring systemic change, which Mike kindly chaired. And the two speakers uh, kind of disagreed on the stage about uh, things. And who they were and what they disagreed about isn't material to my point. My, my, the interesting thing for me was the, re the reaction of the audience. About half the people in the audience loved it, and half the people in the audience really were upset. And, and, the, and the difference was that the people who loved it were the people who'd been immersed in market systems approaches for some years and were familiar with the debates and wanted to see them aired and, and discussed and not sort of, you know, swept under the carpet or whatever. And the people who were really uh, bothered by this were the people who'd come for the answers. They just wanted to be told the answers. And, and, and the idea that there wasn't one answer w was quite upsetting for them. <clears throat> so that's my defense of reminiscing. Of course, it's every old fogey's dream to be asked to reminisce in public for a little while. So I feel like Grandpa Simpson or something. Um, <laughs> but going back to the 80s, um, the 80s and the 90s. <laughs> it, it was a, such a different world then. Um, it, it, it seriously was, and uh, the, the, there were a lot of uh, people trying to provide management training and a bunch of other services to small business, and then microfinance came along and turned everything upside down. And it, it's quite interesting this morning to have the financial sector deepening uh, example, you know, put very front and center because financial services, I think, have always sort of nudged us to do more and different. Um, but at the time, microfinance was going to save the world because it offered um, scale and sustainability in particular. And at the time, we, we were lucky if we were helping, you know, a hundred richly blessed women to sell more handicrafts. And meanwhile, the other 10 million had to sort of work out on their own. Um, so, so the push in the 90s was very much how on earth do we get more scale and sustainability. There wasn't really the talk of complexity or, or systems as such. It was really, guys, we need to get serious about sustainability and scale somehow or other. 
So we actually did five conferences, a bit like this one, in the space of two years, and reviewed a mass of evidence, and, and, and were deeply shocked, I have to say, to discover that the private sector was already providing a lot of what donors were subsidizing in, in the public sector. And, and I think it was quite cathartic for many agencies to realize that what they were doing was entirely in parallel and often displacing um, what the private sector was already trying to do on its own. So that, that basically led to a fork in the road. Do we just uh, have a lot more humility, a lot more flexibility and innovation, or do we make it a thing? Do we have a market systems approach that can be turned into a... Uh, something of a, an, uh, you know, a methodology, if you like. And of course, the, 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 the development industry doesn't really like a, more humility, more innovation, more disruption. What they like is methodologies and, and a thing. So it, it became a thing. And, um, and, it, and it, was, it was big. It, it was quite weird, to be quite honest with you. Business development services suddenly took off. And we had BDS jokes and uh, uh, accusations of being BDS fascist and, and all this kind of uh, odd stuff for a couple of years. So I, I just want to say, careful what you wish for. You know, if you really want to be in fashion, then uh, be ready for this sort of shock of, of, of interest. And also people misquoting you, the, the Washington Consensus uber liberalization crowd were very happy to jump on this. You see, they, they say privatize everything, which wasn't quite the, the, the point. You know, the point was if it's already there, build on it rather than displace it. But that got turned around into a message of, no, no, put everything in the private sector, which, you know, was a, was a little bit different. Um, so I, I, I guess I wanted to just illustrate the fashion idea, because by 2003, um, the World Bank Group um, issued the cost of doing business ranking, and this was a ranking of countries of, according to the ease of doing business in each country. And this, was, this got six times the press coverage of the World Development Report, the, the flagship at the time, and was deeply uh, um, surprising, I think, for everyone. And so, in, in the mid-noughties, the, the business environment reform thing became very fashionable, uh, playing to the macroeconomic training of cut red tape, level the playing field and walk away, you know, let the market work its magic and, and don't get, you know, don't fiddle about picking winners, you know, this was the, this, this was the argument. And at that time, the market systems approach took quite a dip. And, and kudos to uh, Springfield, who's represented by, I see David at the back here, and uh, perhaps one or two others, who, who really kept the flag flying with their training course. Um, which, which I, and we all went through a few lean years. <coughs> Basically, I was organizing conferences. I did a conference a bit like this for once a year for 10 years. And, and 2005, 2006 was a bit of a dip, and then we picked up again and 2008, 2009, we, we were seeing then the design of, of big programs, the sort of programs that Patricia talked about, um, which add up to quite big budgets now coming on stream. So that's a, a, a gallop through history, but I guess what bothers me in all of that is that despite having been going for quite a few years now, we don't have enough showcase examples that are identified as uh, a market systems approach success. Um, we, we really need more, and this would be my one sort of urgent plea to you as practitioners, is, is we, whatever we do, we have to get to the point where we have a few more um, headline examples that are really kind of wow. You know, that, that was fantastic. We've got a few, but we haven't got as many as we should have. And the ones we do have aren't necessarily identified as a market systems approach victory. So one of the reasons for that, we, at, at the 10th annual conference, we all sat down after the conference and we said, you know what, we've got fabulous stories, we've got great concepts, our diagrams are to kill for, but we haven't got two results to rub together. It's, it's really an issue. And um, 
So after that, and was, as part of that, it was 2007, so 2008, we convened a whole series of workshops with program managers in the field of market systems approach programs, saying what's the best you can do on results measurement? Because frankly speaking, you know, headquarters of all the agencies wielding a big stick and saying, we're going to hold you accountable and, and, and you have to tell us what you're achieving and you have to use our methodology, usually led to people in the field saying, well, we don't really like the tone of your voice and you don't understand what we're trying to do and we don't like your methodology much either. So we're going to just drag our feet until you go away and think about something else. And we turned that round. We said, well, for people in the field who are very committed to, to achieving results, that's what we should tap into. There are a lot of program managers who wake up in the middle of the night sweating, thinking, yeah, am I doing the right thing? How do we know that we're on the right track here? And so we need a framework and a toolbox, if you like, a, uh, an approach that would enable field managers to monitor on their own um, how things are going. And monitoring was until then a much neglected kind of art, if you like. It was taken for granted that it would sort of happen and it's part of management and you, 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 you just go and do it. Um, it's actually quite demanding to do properly. And it's also demanding to respond to data that you get back. Um, FSD Zambia, we were hearing about data. It's surprisingly hard to persuade people who are um, passionate about their work that they're going in the wrong direction, even if the data suggests that. So, you know, th th there are lots of things along the way that, that, that need to be addressed. So, basically, we, we, we codified this as a standard for results measurement, which BEAM is picking up on and has expanded on in various directions. Um, what's been interesting is where the support for decent results measurement has come from and where the opposition has come from. For instance, the evaluation profession was initially very against it. It's like, you know, seriously? I mean, this is, this is a thing. This is, you should be happy. Um, but their, their line, which is understandable, is we've had enough self-reported success stories. We've had enough programs saying, you know, claiming outrageous things for, for their achievements, and we don't believe any of them. And, you know, that's kind of reasonable. So the, the evaluation profession went in for a lot of independence. And what's interesting now, and there's a session on this later in the two days, is the pendulum's beginning to swing back. That if you are an evaluator coming in at the end of a very complex program, completely independent and fresh, you're going to really struggle to understand it in the time that you've got. So there needs to be some interaction and some understanding on the way. But this, this whole self-reported thing is an issue. Um, we in development were very good at stringing together a good story because our sort of livelihood depends on it. But what, so what we did, we introduced an audit process around that. So we will audit the results measurement system externally and give a score out of 100 for the quality of, of, of the results measurement system. It's still early days. We've only done about 20 audits, but it's... Well, people will speak about it during these two days, probably. Market systems approaches are, are, are hard to, to marry with the incentives in the industry. All the incentives for everyone, to be quite honest with you, are, are to you know, come up with a few numbers that look roughly right, that are big enough, and then bang them in and hope for the best that there isn't perhaps enough probing and understanding of what it takes to generate meaningful uh, results, data, and so on. Um, in fact, there's been a lot of publications suggesting that development only works in the sort of systemic way we would like it to work because of the commitment of individuals like you. Um, often, high-ranking high officials in development agencies immediately after their retirement publish uh, works to this effect, but while they were in their office, they found it harder, perhaps, to, to say that uh, uh, market systems approaches, for example, were the way to go. But the vision thing, I think, is very, very important. 
Um, we actually need to be better at articulating why we're doing what we're doing. There were various side events yesterday where I was quite impressed. Everyone who spoke was speaking more or less to pledge their allegiance to this thing of market systems approach. It's, it's something you really buy into. Um, but there are a lot of people out there who don't, uh, as Patricia was suggesting. Um, events like this help to build momentum and understanding. Um, we do need the big wins. We really badly need the big wins. And we also need to understand why other people think a different approach would be better or, or, or an alternative. Um, industrial strategy, for instance. You could argue that market systems approaches are premised on the idea that people like us, development professionals, are best placed to diagnose the system, understand the market, intervene strategically, not get captured, um, and, and really get the best result. In a way, that's the underlying premise. Industrial strategy is a little bit the same, but with government officials doing the diagnosis and the intervention and so on. And I mention it partly because on our website at the moment, industrial strategy is the hottest, most popular area. And there are a lot of countries uh, that are saying, you know what, whatever Korea, South Korea did, or whatever Chile did, we want some of that. And that wasn't labeled as market systems approach. It was labeled as industrial strategy. So there's a lot of books coming out at the moment about how different countries prospered thanks to a mix of protectionism and various coordinated support to different industries. Um, very striking, very similar to market systems approach is that the same evidence is taken by different people to draw opposite conclusions, even within the same organization. You'll get, for instance, um, London School of Economics, you'll get professors in LSE saying, you know what, industrial strategy has never worked. And you'll get other professors saying, you know what, industrial strategy, the only thing that's ever worked. <coughs> Same evidence. So it's not just, indeed, it's not just um, about, I've got it. <laughs> it's not just about, um, what the evidence says, but it's how it's interpreted and the values behind it. As Patricia said, we do have to sell what we believe in, not just the mechanics, but the underlying uh, um, the, the values as well. The, honestly speaking, looking around donor agencies, most of them are centre-right governments. Um, there's a lot of pressure to engage more with the private sector directly, um, with big domestic multinational companies, um, that's where the, 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 the biggest shift is at the moment. Now, the, one question perhaps for us is can we compete with that? Or another question might be can we absorb that? Can we do market systems approaches with big companies? Um, it, it, there's a lot of froth around that at the moment, and ironically for me, I have to say, there's a lot of talk around inclusive business, social enterprise, and something called entrepreneurial ecosystems, which is basically what we were trying to do about 20 years ago, which, which is subsidize a lot of different people to provide a whole full suite of services and encourage growth, high growth small business. So that's quite fashionable. Um, it's a little bit difficult to say, you know what, we, we really talked about that a lot um, 15 years ago. You should read the book. Um, that doesn't carry it. So, so there is a certain amount of uh, churning going on there. Business environment reform is still very popular as a thing. Um, perhaps not the, quite the rage it was 10 years ago, but, but still needing to be done. I mean, there's a lot of red tape in a lot of very poor countries that prevents businesses from formalizing, even if they want to. Um, and something, again, that market systems approaches can absorb and accommodate, but not, I mean, business environment reform necessary, but not sufficient. No. Yeah, necessary, but not sufficient. I thought I got the wrong way around for a minute. Finally, what does it take? Why don't we have 
more big successes? I mean, in a way, I think that's quite an interesting question for this conference. Why don't we have more head, after 15 years, say, of doing this stuff, what's getting in the way? And I think one of, it, one of the factors is that we need real high-performing program staff to do it. I made a list. You've got to be an entrepreneur. If you run one of these programs, you've got to have an eye for a business opportunity. You do have to be a bureaucrat. You've got to be able to administer everything very competently. Joanna's nodding. <laughs> you've got to be able to turn out a report just like that. Um, you've got to be an academic, or at very least on top of the academic evidence. You've got to be a diplomat. You've got to keep a lot of different people on board and, be, and speak in tongues. You have to be able to say the same thing to business people using business terminology and making business sense and to development people using development terminology and making development sense. That's, that's a trick. Um, you've got to be a visionary. You've got to have a sense of where you're going to motivate your staff. You've got to be physically fit, available to work hard and travel, and you've got to be lucky. So, that's a lot. Are such people born or made? This is something we could discuss. Finally, I just wanted to articulate a little bit the values behind what we do, because I think the temptation in events like this is to talk about the mechanics and, and the technical aspects. But actually, what we're really about is providing economic opportunity for people at the bottom of the heap, uh, the, uh, the bottomless pit, I think Ruben said at one point, <laughs> quite like that. Um, the, the people who are really in poverty and don't want to be. And the point is that nobody uh, wants to depend on handouts, least of all from random strangers. People want to stand on their own two feet and have the dignity of a job or, or working you know, working their way forward, earning the this, this respect of, of their community and so on. And we're very much about that. We're very much about what would it take to generate the economic opportunities and the jobs that would help people work their own way out rather than depend on charity and kindness of others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, that was predictably very engaging and, and informative speech. Um, so, and thank, thanks for kind of putting all of this in context. I want to say, I have, with an eye to coffee in about 15 minutes, don't, don't give up, hold on. I'm going to say a few words about the Beam Exchange and about specifically what we're hoping to achieve in the next two days. So, um, First of all, BEAM, uh, which incidentally stands for Building Effective and Accessible Markets. Who knew that? You're, you're wonderful. <laughs> so the BEAM Exchange is a facility for knowledge exchange and learning, created specifically to strengthen and extend the application of market systems approaches. And we are indebted to the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation and the UK Department for International Development for an initial three years of funding. Now, Patricia helpfully pointed out, as we're all painfully aware, that it is actually very difficult to neatly define what a market systems approach is. So I'm going to try and make a... <laughs> I'm going to try and think through why that is. Um, from my point of view, it's because we're trying to do two different things. On the one hand, it's a way of looking at the world and, ha and, and a way of thinking about how change happens. So it's a perspective, this, sy this systems perspective. And that's a bit different from, say, focusing on an individual business, an individual company, the investment strategy for a, for, for, for a, for a banker and so, or so on. But it's not just a way of looking at the world, as a, uh, the way of looking at poverty and how poverty is created through systems. It's also a practice. In other words, it's a set of tools and methods and principles that, 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 we, that we adhere to, but which has evolved over many years, as Jim very helpfully pointed out. Um, and that practice is what kind of informs and guides the way we work. 
And the way we work is designed to make it more likely that the changes that we're promoting are inclusive, widespread, and sustained. And yes, it's quite hard to say all that in a, a paragraph or a soundbite. Now, talking of communicating what we do, I just wanted to re refer to this, which is in your packs. I hope you all saw it. It's the, second edition, the, the new second edition of the M4P operational guide. Um, it's not there because I want to venerate M4P in particular. Um, clearly, we are learning a lot. We have learned a lot over the years from practitioners who put different labels on what they do. So, you know, subsector analysis, uh, value chain development, inclusive business even. There's a lot of different labels. But personally, I think that the, the way what we do, the principles and, uh, and the ideas that, that, that sum up what we're doing are articulated very clearly in this document. And I, I want to thank the Springfield Center for the, for the great deal of work I know went into developing this very compact version of the second edition. And I, I hope you will, I hope you've already read it, but I hope you will promote it because it's, it's definitely an asset for us as a, as a sector. Anyway, let's get back to what Beam is doing. Um, there's basically three strands to what Beam is trying to achieve. The first one is capacity building. That is, we're working to expand and strengthen the cadre of well-informed and capable practitioners at all levels in this field. The second thing, I think we've got a, <laughs> the second thing is credibility. We're striving to compile, synthesize, and raise awareness of the evidence base that describes the impact and the effectiveness of these programs that we work on. And the third thing we're doing is around coherence meaning, and this is, this is the hardest one to explain in a way, but we're looking to build more consistency and more consensus across all of us, all of us different stakeholders around what the, the, the practice and the principles and the meaning of market systems approaches are. Now, DFID and SDC took the view very sensibly, I think, that in order to achieve these kind of outcomes, beam needs to have the backing of a, of a lively and engaged community of practice. People like you, in other words. People who are willing to, to exchange knowledge and learn and share and think. So one aspect of what Beam has been doing over the last 18 months has been to create a platform and spaces where we can convene as a community to do that. Now, obviously, here in Lusaka is a a very high profile one, but there have also been various low, lower key events in Abuja, Dar es Salaam, Kathmandu. And then, of course, the, probably the most important platform for us is online through the website. And I'm, I'm going to indulge myself for a couple of minutes and run you very quickly through some of the features on the website, if that's okay, because I'm sure not all of you are familiar with them. So here's a quick overview. First of all, we've got over 100 pages of guidance, which are linked to a resource library with over 500 relevant resources, documents, and other things, including, for example, recordings of webinars that we've run so far. So there's a kind of information base. We've also, we're about to launch a program index which is a directory of all, of all the work that we've identified that's using market systems approaches. It's, a kind of, it's an opportunity for all of you to have a, a window where you can showcase what you do and where you can link to case studies and reports or project documents, impact evaluations, and snapshots of, that explain what a market systems approach is. We've got 
a user directory, so you can identify who else is working in this field, particularly the authors of all those resources that I mentioned. Sorry, Ryan, I don't mean to embarrass you, but <laughs> someone picked that slide. Um, and that also, those, those profiles link to your, to your contributions to this, to this knowledge base. So, for example, the blogs, where you can read what other people are saying in this community. And finally, this is a new feature that's not up there yet, but I'm really excited about it. It's a, it we're calling it the conversation board, and it's, it's, a, it's a single place where you can find all the significant discussion threads that are happening across multiple social pl media platforms, you know, LinkedIn, the website, the D groups, and they're all presented in a very accessible format where you can see the threads, and you, and you can search this, this database of, of threads. So if you're interested to know where, you know, who's talking about a particular topic that you're interested in, you can search for it, and you're, if you're with any luck, you'll find a thread where people are talking about it. So I haven't got time to, um, I haven't got time to discuss everything that Beam does, but I just wanted to mention two other things which are important for the next two days. One is we've got a research program, we've commissioned various research, and it's described in a, in a, in a, a briefing note that you'll find in your welcome pack. And the other is we're doing a whole range of things related to this strengthening the evidence base, and that's going to be very much um, covered in the evidence track. Which brings me back to the conference. I want to recap on three challenges, if you like, that, that have been brought up by, by Jim and Patricia, which I think are very helpful. The first one is this issue of the, por the, the paucity of evidence. We're going to hear over today and tomorrow, I think, in the results and insights track, particularly, a lot of compelling stories, a lot of compelling results achieved by, by mature programs that have been running for, for several years. But there's a problem because it's, it, there seems to be a problem in translating those results, and you'll hear great stories, it seems to be a problem translating that into the kind of robust evidence that, that gives confidence to donors and development partners. And I think the question is, why is that? And what can we do about it? So that's what the evidence track is really essentially focusing on. And then the second issue I want to raise, the second issue that, that Jim and raised in particular, is around uh, implementation bottlenecks associated with human resource constraints. This is a recurring issue. Um, now, I, I, Jim, you, Jim's already explained how demanding our approach is in terms of what we expect of, of the people who manage and, and work in it. Um, there is a distinct set of skills and competencies that seem to be needed. And they're different from what both what maybe you know, investment bankers need or what conventional development aid projects need. So the question is, are, those, are these HR issues, are these just growing pains because we've take, you know, as an industry we've kind of taken off so quickly? Or are they a symptom of something a bit deeper that we need to address? And in, in the second, the, the, the third track that I haven't mentioned in the conference is going to be about innovative applications of market systems approaches. And I guess the question is, before we start, and there's some great stories, by the way, I hope you'll, you'll go to some of those sessions, but before we really promote the innovative, the wider application of market systems approaches, the question for me is, you know, are we confident that we've solved the training and the capacity building constraints? And finally, I just want to talk about the politics or the, poli the political economy of aid. Again, Jim articulated it much better than I could. But, and Patricia said, you know, Patricia asked this question. She said, well, what, are, are, is this approach practicable in a world dominate, you know, in the world that we live in, dominated by five-year time frames? pressure for short-term results, log frames, annual reviews, you know, are the, what do we need to recognize the realities of where we work, the norms and the incentives of our, op our own operating context? And what could or should we do about that? Okay, so, there you go, those are the three issues. I'm, I'm going to come back to those, well, the, the, good, the good news is I'm not, 
expecting you to answer those questions today. I, I want you to relax. I want you to sit back and listen to these fascinating, interesting stories. We've got some very, some very inspiring speakers. But then I think after you've had a good night's sleep, tomorrow I'd like, to come, I'd like you to come back and, and let's see if we can actually work on some of these questions. We'll, what we'll do is we'll come back to it, in the, particularly in the final plenary session where we'll have a panel to talk about it. But I hope by that stage you will have a lot to say as well about these topics. Meanwhile, I hope you enjoy the rest of, the next, the rest of today until you see me next. And thanks very much for coming. Thank you very much, Mike. That was the end of our morning plenary, but I just wanted to tell you that I hope it was as useful for you as it was for us. It helped us put market systems into context, the objectives of the conference, and what we hope to achieve in the next two days. If I could just break this up a little bit, and I just want to ask you one thing, and I want you to refer to your welcome packs now. So my question would be, are you feeling excited about the next two days? Or are you feeling like you could have probably used your time better elsewhere? So this is if you're excited. So all of you should have a green card in there. This is if you're just waiting to see actually what the breakout sessions are going to be like. And this is if you would rather be at Victoria Falls right now. <laughs> Can we all do that? Can I just get a quick vote just with your colors? Yeah, that's fab. Can we get a document of that? Thank you. I can see a red. I will address you later, Austin. That's not cool. <laughs> no, perfect. We're as excited as you are. And before we go off to coffee break, I just wanted to say this is exactly what we want in the conference. We want it to be as interactive and as participatory as possible. When you go off into your breakout sessions, we want you to engage with your session leads and your speakers, be vocal about your opinions and your views, any questions you have. But in terms of documenting some of it, what we've done for you at the breakout sessions, you will find some mats called inspiration mats. There's one for each of the delegates attending. And what all we want to do is capture some of your thoughts. So if you have feedback, if you have some key ideas that you came up with, just scribble them down. And if you do put down your named, all the named entries will be <laughs> given up for a draw for a free subscription to Enterprise Development and Microfinance Journal. So I think that's a good, a good incentive. Let's all try to engage with that. Let's use the inspiration mats. Let's be vocal. Great. Let's off to the breakout sessions then. Have fun, everybody. Okay, give me one more.